Drunken stumbles, bailing on brides, and one wedding night so disastrous the groom didn't make it out alive. Marriage isn't easy, and these royal couples are proof that you can't force a love match. We can now say the marriage of the then Prince Charles to Lady Diana Spencer was doomed from the beginning, but it's easy to forget that in 1981, the public had high hopes after their fairy tale wedding. Little did they know that the royal couple suffered through a less than spectacular wedding night, according to Tina Brown's The Diana Chronicles. Speaking of their wedding night, Prince Charles said, That first night was nothing special. It was pleasant enough, of course, but she really was painfully naive. Prince Charles wasn't the only one who proved unimpressed. Diana felt less than bowled over by her first intimate moments with him. She later recalled his performances as robotic and functional. Come on, come on, get a grip. Come on, punch through. Go Confiding in a close friend, Diana categorized their lovemaking issues as geographical in nature. Coupled with the fact that Charles had to remain in constant communication with his ex Camilla, all around it was a less than blissful newlywed experience. The wedding of Puyi, the last Chinese emperor to Gabilo Wan Rong, was a highly publicized event, but their honeymoon would become the focus of scandal, according to China Daily. After what many consider to be one of the most opulent weddings in Chinese history, the newlyweds were supposed to retire to their royal bedroom, and catastrophe struck. As reported by Arnold C. Brackman in The Last Emperor, after the wedding, palace servants transported the newlyweds on a sedan chair to the Palace of Heavenly Peace, where tradition dictated they spend the night. Before entering the room, the emperor had to shoot three arrows over his bride to scare off bad spirits. But 17-year-old Puyi had poor eyesight and wasn't permitted to wear his spectacles during the ceremony, so he declined to shoot the arrows to avoid inadvertently wounding his wife. But this proved just the beginning of the scandal. Upon entering the palace of earthly peace, Puyi felt anything but tranquil. Surveying the chamber filled with red decorations and a big bed, he felt overwhelmed and panicked. He later recalled, I looked around me and saw that everything was red. It all looked like a melted red wax candle. I did not know whether to stand or sit. Overcome by anxiety, he fled the room, leaving his new bride alone and confused. When it suited Henry VIII, he claimed that Catherine of Aragon, his former sister-in-law, had never consummated her marriage to his older brother Arthur, Prince of Wales, according to History Extra. This permitted him to marry his sister-in-law, despite the church considering them related. What was your relationship with Spain like? Complicated. But when Henry VIII later sought the dissolution of his marriage to Catherine, he changed his tune. Henry VIII claimed the marriage to Arthur had indeed been consummated, providing the grounds for an annulment by the Pope, but Catherine would have none of this. Per William Hill's Tudor England and Encyclopedia, she stuck to the original story that her marriage to Arthur had never been sealed with a physical act before his premature death. While Catherine admitted they slept in the same bed seven times, she claimed he proved too weak to do anything else. Their wedding night and the nights following turned out to be a major disappointment. Or as Catherine eloquently put it, she remained as intact and uncorrupted as the day she left her mother's womb. Eyewitnesses to events during her marriage to Arthur backed up these claims, saying Catherine had lamented the fact they likely would never enjoy marital relations. According to the Chateau de Versailles, Louis Auguste met Marie Antoinette only hours before their wedding, making the walk to the bridal bedchamber for the consummation of their union awkward. The Archbishop of Reims blessed the nuptial bed, and King Louis XV gave his grandson a nightshirt and some advice. Marie Antoinette was given a nightshirt, and then the king kissed them both and left the room. Instead of marking the start of a new family, however, nothing happened, and this nothing continued for years. Rumors have long abounded that the Dauphin suffered from a genital deformity that made sexual arousal painful, according to History Channel's The French Revolution. They also claim he initially refused surgery to fix the condition, but there's no consensus when it comes to the king's sexual issues. In her book Marie Antoinette's The Journey, Antonia Fraser argues Louis XVI had no physiological problems and never had surgery. Instead, he lacked instruction. Eventually, Marie Antoinette's mother, Maria Theresa, sent her son, Emperor Leopold II, to France to investigate. After speaking with the king, Leopold chalked up the problems to inexperience, laziness, and blundering. After some frank discussions about the birds and the bees with his brother-in-law, the duo figured it out, consummating their marriage seven years and three months after their wedding ceremony. Growing up in the Prussian royal family wasn't for the faint of heart. Not only was Frederick II's father a complete psychopath, but he forced Frederick to watch his childhood friend and rumored lover be executed as punishment for attempting to help Frederick run away from home. So when it came to a forced marriage arranged by his dad to Elizabeth Christina of Brunswick Bevern, things didn't really go well. According to Tim Blanning's Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, immediately following his wedding night, Frederick wrote to his older sister, Thank God that is over. 
While we'll never know the play-by-play -play of what transpired behind closed doors, the couple remained notoriously distant, leading separate lives in separate cities, as reported by the Royal Collection Trust. What's more, he spoke of his wife with great disdain, referring to her as, quote, this incorrigibly sour subspecies of the female sex. Frederick claimed the very word marriage inflicted him with acute physical pain, likening it to the bubonic plague. In the context of these strong words, hatred of his father, possible homosexuality, and the letter to his sister, Frederick and Elizabeth Christina's wedding night proved mind-blowing in a catastrophic way. The marriage of Princess Caroline of Brunswick to George IV proved anything but a love match, as reported by David Soud in Kings and Queens of Great Britain, every question answered. After meeting for the first time, George, then the Prince of Wales, demanded brandy, so repulsed was he by Caroline's lack of personal hygiene and coarse manners. Of course, George wasn't exactly marriage material either. At 32, he'd let himself go. He spent copious amounts of money on women and wine and had even secretly married another woman before Caroline. That said, the royal family found a way to negate this clandestine union, putting monetary and political advantage before happiness. On paper, the match with Caroline looked ideal, but the reality proved downright grim. The couple passionately disliked each other. At the wedding, George was so drunk he didn't participate in portions of the ceremony. From there, his behavior descended into inebriated sobbing at the altar. By their disastrous wedding night, George got so smashed that he fell into the bedroom grades where Caroline left him for the rest of the night for historic UK. Nevertheless, the marital obligations were met that night or the next day, producing their one and only child, Princess Charlotte of Wales. Although Sophie of anhalt zerbst or Catherine the Great as she would become known, charmed the Russians upon her arrival at court from Prussia, one man wanted nothing to do with her, her future husband, Peter III. Not only was he a troublemaking alcoholic, but he kept armies of miniature soldiers under the bed that he played with at night, according to Town & Country. These habits didn't bode well for a romantic wedding night. All right, men, you heard him. Code Red, repeat. We are at Code Red. Recon plan Charlie. Execute. Let's move, 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 move. Catherine waited hours for her new husband to show up. When he finally arrived in the marital chamber, he passed out drunk. Inebriation aside, Peter proved more interested in the aforementioned toy soldiers under the bed than hooking up. Later, Catherine claimed the couple never consummated their relationship. Although she eventually had children while her husband was still alive, there is evidence other men may have fathered them. While scholars still argue over why Peter proved so disinterested in his spirited and attractive young bride, it may have had something to do with his emotional and physical scarring, the result of surviving smallpox. What's more, well before their marriage, the duo had expressed dislike for one another, hardly the grounds for a stellar wedding night. Henry VIII had a long history of failed marriages, and his wedding to Anne of Cleves proved especially disastrous via history. After two years as a single man, Henry's advisors remained in a tizzy to ensure the king produced more male heirs. Their poking and prodding finally convinced Henry to enter into a marriage agreement with the German Duke of Cleves' sister, Anne. Seeing the woman's attractive portrait helped push him over. But when the betrothed couple met before the wedding, he realized the promising portrait was a lie. Not only did she look nothing like the image, but Henry felt no attraction to her whatsoever. This made sealing the deal on their wedding night a serious issue. After the honeymoon, the monarch confessed to Thomas Cromwell that he had trouble fulfilling his husbandly duties, elaborating that he, quote, left her as good a maid as I found her, for Tudor's dynasty. When Statyra married Alexander the Great in Susa in 324 BC, she had no illusions about her group's fidelity. According to Graham Phillips' Alexander the Great, not only did the ruler of the known world already have another wife, but it was well known that he had once enjoyed a homosexual relationship with Hephaestion, who still remained a loyal companion. Hephaestion was also the other groom at the wedding, marrying Satyra's sister. But what neither bride knew was that the romance between Alexander and Hephaestion had rekindled en route to Susa. I think there are things beyond our imagining. Nevertheless, it still shocks Satyra to get dumped on her royal wedding night in favor of her new brother-in-law. Alexander and Hephaestion spent the night sequestered together, leaving both of their brides out in the cold. Alexander's choice of companion on the second wedding night horrified his first wife, Roxana, who hailed from the Sogdians. This tribe believed a husband's homosexual relationships reflected directly on his wife's honor and femininity, which Phillips hypothesizes may have provided a strong motive for her to later poison Alexander and Hephaestion. Before his wedding, rumors swirled about William III, the Prince of Orange's sexual orientation. The royal wedding night did little to ease the gossip, as reported in James Johnson's A Profane Wit, The Life of John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. 
In fact, the cool reception he showed his bride, Mary II, on their honeymoon soon became the fodder of gossip among Europe's nobility. Just 15 years old, Mary had cried for days after learning she had to marry her 26-year-old cousin. William of Orange kept his bride and the King of England, Charles II, waiting until midnight while he went into town to grab a bite to eat. When he eventually arrived for the big event, he refused to remove the woolen drawers he wore. When the King of England suggested he remove them, he said simply he'd grown accustomed to wearing them to bed and wasn't about to change. Adding to the awkwardness of the whole event was Charles II. According to Kevin Haddock Flynn's Orangeism, a historical profile, the king acted drunk and cheered on the newlyweds, proclaiming, Now, nephew, to work. St. George for England. Despite the English king's enthusiasm, the couple never welcomed an heir. One of the most feared warriors to ever ride across the plains of Europe was Attila the Hun. Per history, he only ever suffered one defeat, which came at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, to a combined force of Romans and Goths. This military resume makes his gruesome death on his wedding night all the more bizarre. Attila had many wives when he decided to add a woman named Ildico to his Germanic harem. The wedding took place at Attila's palace and involved plenty of indulging. Attila stayed up partying into the wee hours in the morning before he finally showed up in the bedroom where Ildico patiently awaited her new husband. What happened next remains a mystery. The next morning, guards heard sobbing coming from the bedroom and broke down the door. They found Attila dead inside with Ildico inconsolable by his side. Examination of his body showed he didn't have any visible wounds, but it was obvious he'd suffered a nosebleed in the night, which historian Priscus of Panium concluded had caused him to choke to death on his own blood. 